Okay, so Hugh, uh, one of the posts you've, you've done on Instagram and, and, and YouTube, which has gone pretty viral, is uh, where you talk about how to retire in seven years, uh, starting from zero. And I know you're talking about this topic, and it's something that you've you've sort of started to own the space in. Um, I'd love to hear more about the story and and where this idea and concept comes from. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a game changer for me when I first came across it. So. Um, the reason I was really into money was because I was so bad at it. Like a lot of your clients and people you work with, they're in a really bad state and they need to kind of transform. You kind of start from somewhere. And I just had enough. I was in debt. I was in like over five figures of debt, two overdrafts, loans, you know, just money would just come in and just go straight away. So I knew I needed to fix that. So I went about that and challenged myself for a couple of years. I basically uh, completed Martin Lewis's website. Like, so the money saving expert, I just went through every guide of how to change your phone, how to lower this bill, change insurance policies. And I blitzed it. And um, at that point, I'd kind of cleared that I got what I need to be. And now I had savings. It was like, what do I do with this? Um, So started learning about investing and came across index investing. It's a good way to start. So, okay, a bit more Googling. Came across these guys um, in the fire community and one famous person, the OG is um, Mr. Money Mustache. And um, if you if you put Mr. Money Mustache simple math in uh, to Google, it'll be the first post that comes up. And in this post, it shows you a table of your savings rate, because what he articulated was wealth is not a number. It's not a 500 grand, a million or 10 million. It's an equation. So it just comes down to your savings rate. Um, as a percentage of your income so if you get paid 100 grand and you save 50 grand of that and invest that 50 grand you have a savings rate of 50 percent now that's extremely hard to get to and when I saw this I actually thought like I I worked out what mine was and it was 38 percent and I was like you know I am a savings god you know brought down (laughs) to planet from with mere mortals to show how you can save and then I looked at that blog post and was seeing that Mr. Money Mustache, as well as many other people, were doing 50, 70, 80, 90% savings rate. So, yes, getting paid 100 grand and saving 90% of that and investing it. Um, so, I then went down the rabbit hole of learning how to live uh, that way. And there were just two numbers that really stood out to me, which is one that you've alluded to. So, the first bit was if I were to manage 50%, I was at 38, you know, it was doable. 50% would mean that I would retire, roughly speaking, around. 15 to 16 years, if I invested that money into a global index tracker, you know, S&P 500 jobby, right? And the other figure was that if I were to save 70, um, 75%, then I could retire in seven years. And I read this when I was 31. I was like, holy shit, this is, this is big. Like, could I potentially do that? Could I do this by the time I'm 40? And that's really got the wheels in motion for me to see what I could do and see if I could retire by the time I'm 40. Wow. So were you, um, you know, you said you were in debt and uh, overdrawn. What was your, your how, how, what was your relationship with money like at the time? Um, and how are you handling your finances? I, I didn't respect it really. Um, I, I kind of, I've said on many podcasts or videos, like I was a bell end in my twenties. Uh, just used to go drinking every weekend. Um, I would live for the weekend as soon as I got paid that was there to be used. Um, and then when I used that money, I would try and get money from elsewhere, which was like credit cards, overdrafts, loans, and then spend that as well. My granddad gave me a thousand pounds as like a, a life gift. He, he invested it w- when I was born. And then I had this gift given to me in my early twenties, just spent it just, just stupid with money. I didn't, I didn't respect it. And it was really when I found my other half Lou and I thought, you know, she's a keeper. I've got to like, you know, be the best version I can to keep someone like that. And I looked at my money situation. I thought, God, this is, this is atrocious. Like I need to sort that out. So really it was down to um, me wanting to work on my relationship and be a better version, you know, to try and be someone that's worth staying with. I'd reached that low. So that's really the kind of catalyst, but yeah, my relationship was poor. Um, I then started um, probably valuing money too much and went so extreme and to not spend any money on anything i got I, I was probably too frugal and then i kind of find more of a balance now where you know it's not just about not spending it's about only spending money in things that can provide value for your life um experiences time with friends uh things like that, things that you use on a daily basis things that can eradicate pain 
Um, uh, so yeah, I've kind of gone through the full motion, but in my experience, the people with money are the people that respect it the most. Okay. So this whole concept of, you know, retiring in seven years, what's this predicated on with regards to, uh, your current income, uh, is it based on a current income that you can do this or is it something that if you earn 25 grand 50 grand 100 grand it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah it's, it's all down to a percentage so okay if you if you have a look um if you go onto the website mr money mustache and you google that and then the simple um maths mr money mustache simple maths that that it's like it's surprisingly simple math for time behind early retirement it's something like that it's the blog post and he has got this all layered out uh th this table of if you save 10 percent, it will take you x amount of years to retire if you save 20 and so and so all the way down to 90 um it doesn't matter what you earn it's it's what you save that really matters so you can earn 100k a year you can earn, earn a million if you spend 100k or you spend a million a year you have no wealth you know you've lived and you might be happy with that that's fine but you will not retire if you earn a hundred grand or you earn a million and you save every single penny, you're retired. You don't need that money to live on. So you, you are like financially independent. So if you break those numbers down, the ones that really stood out to me were like the kind of 25, 50, 75. Um, incidentally, I think in the UK and the US, it's like in single digits. It's really embarrassing. It's like kind of 3% marker. And it means that you have to work for like 70 years to retire unless something else happens. It's, you know, you have inheritance, pension scheme through work something else to help you retire now some that you know some people might not care and they're fine doing their job until they're 65 70 and power to you i just didn't want that and, and my family i don't come from wealth we're not poor but we're not wealthy so i knew i had to make my own so I, my goal was to see how quickly i could get to retirement as a bit of a challenge as well because i'm that type of guy uh, so i had the goal of trying to do it in nine years but seven years specifically is saving 75 percent um, of your income Okay. Now, what do you do if, let's say you earn £50,000, you earn £50,000, but your life expenses mean that pretty much everything, you, you need to use pretty much all your money, whether it's because of nursery fees, um, mortgage, just day-to-day -day living. Where where are you looking to create the extra, extra space, uh, so to speak? So when I started With this, we're looking at now, I think 2013-14, um i had a mortgage and i was living on less than ten thousand pounds a year and that drives like people like create like how is that possible i was i was earning 30k a year at the time and i was doing kind of side hustle stuff and then investing all of that too so i was saving two-thirds of my money like 66 percent, and then it was topped up by doing side hustle things selling things a e ebaying car booting um, match betting and then publishing which was then you know my, my now cash flow business um but so I don't live on that now, but I did. So I lived on 800 quid. I live on probably, I think it's now around 1200 pounds a month. And then for that, that's, that gets everything covered. And then I spend, now I'm pushing myself to spend more. And I'm say, I'm spending probably up to six grand on like whatever, no, sorry, six grand, 600 quid <laughs> uh, to make it up to two grand a month. So I yeah, live just yeah. outside of Cambridge. Um, and we've got a small mortgage uh, it's on it's a favorable mortgage it's on like 1.82 percent it's interest only so we've got a low fee um uh on that and yeah the, the the main areas to to make your savings you've got housing transport and food so you know housing you've got the big one is the mortgage so you can you can mess around and try and save two quid here and there on your mobile data but you know, really, your mortgage is probably going to be the biggest thing you can make a savings on. Um, then you're looking at like fuel bills, tax, insurance, that type of thing. Um, looking at your car um, and transport in general, I should say, because it's not just car. Uh, a lot of people, like I don't understand how people um, commute like 45 minutes and plus. Like I, I don't understand it. Uh, is there a way that you can move closer, be more economical with your options, carpool, bike to work, run to work, whatever. So I was about two and a half miles from work. I sold my car, used that money to invest it to make me money and also save me money on petrol, car tax, car insurance, what have you. Um, by the way, I didn't do this happily. Like I just challenged to see how low I could go. And normally most people aren't willing to go that far. Much like if you're doing a cut for the first time, like, well, I don't want to go too low. Well, you know, you won't allow yourself to go too low. You probably have, you know, most people don't have the willpower, the strength and endurance to go that low, but you'll learn something about yourself in the process. And, you know, I was very nervous about 
getting rid of Sky TV. I was nervous about living with one car, but we we tried it, we did it. And actually, not only was it okay, it added value to our life. Like I walked to work. So then it took me 40 minutes to walk to work. And what did I do? I put on a podcast and was like, listen to audiobooks and stuff. So rather than I'd come in the office, I was like, you know, like I've got, I've just been walking for 40 minutes, got a nice little buzzy sweat on, you know, if ready to go, you know, let's go guys. And then people are walking in, yawning, just getting out of there, you know, their mobile sofas. Um, so, you know, that's just an example of where you can kind of use it to add value to your life. But um, and, and making packed lunches, I used to get rinsed for bringing chicken and broccoli to work every day. That was like, you know, that was my always oh, got it again, you know, but that's, you know, it was cheap, it was healthy, did the job for me. So um, there are areas to make all those savings. And what I would just encourage people is to try it first, like walk a mile in someone's shoes before you judge them. So mm -hmm. give it a whirl. And if you don't like it, you can always revert back in most cases. Okay. Um, and you said that, you know, you did this begrudgingly. T talk us through that psychology, because that's the really hard bit to let go of, right? It's like if you're, you know, if you're earning 50 grand and you're like, where can I find the extra pennies? And then it's like, okay, well, you could do this. You, you could be telling someone the advice, but doing it is another thing. So talk about the psychology. What's the psychology behind having a saving mindset? And then we talk about the investing and like where to actually put your money. Uh, as, a, as the next sort of segue but how, how do you get the psych what's the psychology by now where have you seen people go wrong where do you see people go right mm. um, how do you approach it what happens if kids come in does it affect the way you approach this or is it still the same principles apply yeah great question there's lots to unpack there so from a from a psychology point of view one really useful tip for me was Mr. Money Mustache on this on this post kind of shows his workings out how he got to those numbers. And these are based on assumptions. And these assumptions actually on his site are very conservative, like to the extent where he's saying 5% returns. You know, I work on more of a realistic basis of like more like 7% because historically they've been even higher than that. But I think even 5% is too conservative. So you can, you can play around with these numbers. But the assumption being that when you hit your point where your investment income covers your living expenses at the point that you're financially independent and this table shows roughly when that would be and when you come to retirement there's something known as the four percent safe withdrawal rate so if you have let's say a million pounds in your account in your stocks and shares account and it's going up on average seven percent a year it will never be seven percent it will be sometimes two percent then minus five then plus 30 then plus 10 but on the average it's been more than it's more like nine percent, okay, before inflation. So you could take off a couple of percent for inflation, albeit it's higher now, but historically two to three percent is what's historical. You might get around seven percent returns. And the idea is not to take all that out, it's to take out just four percent and leave three in or leave whatever's more. If it goes up 30 percent, you still take four percent, and next year you take four percent. So you just take a little bit of a layer and let it grow and let it grow, okay? So if you go on the four percent safe withdrawal rate, meaning you could take that out at like 30, 40, and theoretically, more, more than likely, based on historical data, you can go all the way through to retirement and not run out of money. You can reverse engineer that mathematics. So if you've got a million pounds, you can take out 4%, which is 40 grand a year. So you've been working on the, the 50 grand basis. So we're just shy of that. So around 5%, you'd be, you'd be around that. Um. If you work out what you spend on anything, so I'll take Sky, for example. I was spending something like 52, 53 quid a month on Sky. And I'm not paying 53 quid a month on Sky. You work out what it is over the basis of the year. So I times that by 12. And then that figures my annual fee. Now, to have that covered, I need that amount coming in my investment income at 4%. Mm. So the reversal of 4% is by multiplying by 25 OK, so if you multiply any annual expense by 25, then you're working out what you need invested to yield a 4% return to cover that thing. So if you follow me so far, I think if you, you know, I'll go on the basis now. Got my calculator, Rakesh. So I'm a spreadsheet guy. So let's say 50 quid a month. And we know that times 12 is coming out at 600 pounds a year. Now, if I multiply that by 25, that comes out at 15 grand. So Sky is no longer 50 quid a month. I need 15,000 pounds invested at 4% to cover that in retirement. Therefore, is Sky worth 15,000 pounds? And this is one of those questions when put to me, I was mm -hmm. like, ah, light bulb. Because for me, it wasn't. So would you say 15 grand to save that? And now you have a more healthy, realistic question with the end point in mind. 
So maybe it's your gym membership. I spend 50 quid a month on my gym membership. I need 15,000 pounds invested. Would you save and invest 15 grand to have your gym membership? Well, absolutely. It's so important to me. I get so much value for it. That's absolutely what I want. But it's asking that real question of what you're prepared to do in retirement to get that. So it was really about structuring that out. And when you multiply any annual expense by 25 to get what amount you need invested at a 4% return, you can really start to question what is valuable in your life and what isn't and what's disposable. And when you eradicate one thing, such as a £50 a month gym uh, gym or Sky subscription, it actually equates to £15,000 less. So now your retirement pot goes down. And if you can save 100 quid a month here, it goes down again, you know, it goes down again. So it was really a goal for me. And I gamified it, like how low can yeah. I go? And that's where I kind of got into, you know, there were some things I was like, I actually know, you know, and there's diminishing returns. You get so far, like I could live on 800 quid a month, but you know what? To get to 700 was like painful. Like it was rubbish. Like, I, I, and I didn't want that. So then it was a case of then reversing it and thinking right now, how can I earn more money? Because the sky's the limit. I can earn billions of pounds a year. That's on me. But I always think the best starting point is expenses first, because you can earn billions and you can still spend billions and become broke. You need to know how to manage money. And that's why Mm. I think it starts with expenses and then goes on to earning extra income. Yeah, because you always hear of people living paycheck to paycheck and not in a sense of they're not making enough money, but they're making more than enough money, but they're constantly worried about the next or wondering when the next paycheck's coming in because they're they increase their lifestyle overheads as their income goes up and it's been one thing i've always tried to be self-aware about is as as income goes up my lifestyle overheads remain the same and i'm very similar to you in that you know we live a, we live very i'd say frugally um i don't know if that's the right word but we we you know it's it's very cheap living and for me it's it gives me a sense of peace that i don't have to worry about having to meet expensive overheads just to live from a day-to-day perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're aligned with that, Akash. And I, I think for me, I'd forgo Sky TV and at the time the car. Again, I don't lo- live like this now. We have Now TV, which has Sky Sports. I've got a car that's m- much more than I need. I paid for it cash outright. Like I don't live like I used to, but I still live. I think the key of what you're saying is well within my means when most yeah. people live above them. And the reason for that and the driver, when people are like, you're a boring bastard, you've got no life, you must be so miserable, <laughs> the comments I kind of get, which is you know, fundamentally untrue because I'm very happy with what I do. I would prefer to save my money for freedom. Freedom is the ultimate value for me. So knowing that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, is worth much more than Sky or four holidays a year, which I could do. I could go out and get a Ferrari, but I don't. I would prefer not to ever work again or have the option to not work again. I do work, but so interestingly, yeah. Interestingly, uh, interesting at Christmas, someone was talking about Sky and apparently Sky now with the full Sky Sports and, and, and everything is about 100, 120 quid a month. Is it really? I wow. can't believe okay. it. Yeah. You're looking at, so you're looking just even rough maths, like over 30 grand, you know, maybe 35, 40 grand invested, saved, invested to support Sky in your retirement. And, you know, look, for some people, that is that is really important and power to you. As long yeah. as you're you're making intentional decisions that are providing value in your life, uh, that, that's really the question. I'm not telling, telling people what to do and what not to do, mm. but just have the yeah. real numbers to make that informed decision. With regards to what you said around 7% and then 3% is taken, 3% Four. is kept in, 4% you yes. pull out, right? Yeah. Can you just walk, can you just explain that again and, yeah, this, and how exactly that works? Problem. Confuses everyone, right? So the stock market, so the historical returns are like high single digits. It's more like 9 to 10% on a global index tracker. And if you account for inflation, which over historical terms is more like between 2 and 3%, you'll have a more realistic number of around 7% a year. So go uh, test me, go go and find out that I think 7% is pretty fair. You know, some people will say higher, some people will say lower. I think it's pretty reasonable. So if it's going up 7% over, over the long term, because that's we only invest with money we're not prepared to use, and we only invest for the long term, i.e. 10 plus years okay, in the stock market, you can ride out then any lows, any highs and lows. You just keep going. So if it's going up 7%, you would only take 4% of that, leave it. So if you had 100K and theoretically it went exactly 7%, which is unlikely, but let's say it does, you got 107. So you take out four grand leaving you with 103 now you earn seven percent on 103 rather than 100 so you'll go up more than the seven percent it'll be over 110 if that makes sense then you take out four again so you go down to 107 108 whatever it is 
and you just repeat that process. So in theory, you'll always be building your pot and never spending more than you need to. But over time, you'll be able to take your 4% will be will will mean more because it's growing. So that's the that, idea behind it. And that 4% is just an extra bit of income or is that what you're effectively living off? Well, that was my goal was to just live on that and nothing else. But oh, wow. so 4,000 pounds across the year. Yeah, well, my, my goal was to build it up to quarter of a million. Okay, I and understood. Then to live on the ten grand, like to that was my goal. Got it. Um, got it. Got it. But I still don't touch my money because I have a side business which pays for everything for me. So this is all kind of like you know building up my wealth and giving me extra options and freedom. You know, moving forward. Um, so yeah, I don't take that money out. I am just trying to continue building it. But the the intention of going into it initially was to get this this quarter of a million pot to allow me to live on ten grand a year, but that would have taken a little longer. And I, and I wanted to, um, you, you know, what, why not work at the same time? I didn't just want to be an investor, you know, don't want to just, in, you know, be reliant on the stock market. I tried to hedge my bets and I've gone into property um, and also business as well. Okay. It makes sense. So you've got this um, extra bit of money each month to invest. What do you do with the, what do you do with the money? Like, how do you know where to invest, uh, how to invest, risk profiles what's reliable what's reliable what's a shiny object there's so many things you can get kind of bombarded with different ideas then obviously the newspaper is obviously always uh reflexively uh attracting you to different things um that you think you know that could could be things to to invest in so how do you how do you then manage your portfolio um and choose what to invest in and also Maybe also speak to you know what are the minimums that you should be looking at. You know, if you're saving hundred pound a month, is that a, you know should you be putting that in investments or you know there's almost that thing of like oh it's only hundred quid like what's the point of doing that is you know is that is that still worthwhile investing? Um, and then yeah. if so, where do where do you invest it? Yeah, so um, okay, as far as where do you go investing it? It's it's a I think globally is the right way around it. I, I, I've got a video you can go to my YouTube channel and see Hugh Davis investing for beginners and I kind of walk people a bit more through this in, in some detail of how I've got to that so whenever I'm working with my friends and my family and myself this is what I kind of learned through the process and it's really low cost global index trackers which don't have expensive fund managers um, they invest in all the major companies and if you spend a hundred pound on an investment or ten thousand pounds all you're doing is buying a cut in thousands of hundreds or if not thousands of different companies so one of the common things that people come across is the S&P 500 big fan of it I personally invest in it I'm not going to tell anyone to invest in something or not I'm not a financial advisor but the S&P 500 is a really solid place it's the biggest 500 companies in the US when you're thinking well I thought you said global like it, the US isn't that a little bit too much um, US centric well if you have a look at the biggest companies you can see the top 10 holdings you've got Amazon are they global like one of the most you know global companies there are Facebook the same do we use Facebook in the UK everyone uses Facebook um Google same so actually the S&P 500 although it exists in the US is a global distribution um however in the YouTube video that I showed you there are actually two funds that I show which are more global based which do account for UK companies Japanese companies Australian companies etc so Look, most people overthink this part, and that isn't a thing to overthink. People people want to focus on which is the best fund, where do I put my money? That's not going to make the difference. The difference is what you contribute. Okay, so people think that how can I get seven percent up to eight? That's not going to make the difference. The difference is how can you go from hundred to two hundred and double your contribution? That's going to have the biggest impact on your wealth, which is why I focus back on expenses initially and then increasing people's income. So we can play games with which is the best. Is the S and P five hundred the best? No. But if you have a look at over the longer term, it beats 90% of funds and fund managers. And that's good enough and move on. You know, like yeah. people come to you, it's like, what's the best training regime? Like, I want the, per like, there isn't, <laughs> there isn't one perfect. There's different things for different occasions. As long as you're doing some of the right, you know, the right basics, that's all you need to be doing. And there are multiple ways to win in this, in this format, but low cost, global, um, contribute what you can and look to increase that contribution over time and only invest money you're not prepared to touch for 10 years. If you think you may need that within the next two to five years, then invest it because we might go in a downturn during that period and you don't want to have to sell at a loss. Um, you know, I think that the longer you leave it, the more uh, likely you are to come out on top. And I think it's something like 
90 or 95 percent if you invest for 10 years and if you invest for 20 years uh stocks will always be cash so that was my goal that's on a safety net as long as I'm prepared to invest for at least 10 ideally 20 years I'll always win in the stock market so do you say if it's two to five years you need the money don't invest I wouldn't I wouldn't use that money no okay. because you are hoping and you need that money to be up in two years time it might not be all we need is another COVID COVID dropped 30 percent in like just over 30 days so mm. you might go up 7%, 10%. So you're up 15% and then it drops 30% in 30 days. And now I need this money. I need it for the house mm. deposit. That if, if you need cash within five years, I think is a, a very basic rule of thumb, then keep it in cash. Like only invest money you're prepared to, basically it doesn't exist for 10 years. And you can then ride out any storm and you will, you know, the, the less you need it, you know, the um, he who cares less wins. I love that in negotiation, right? And it's the same for investing. Oh, I don't need that money. I'll park it. I don't need it. It's fine. Then you then you will win because you can always wait for a downturn to kind of turn around because they always do. You'll always get crashes and you'll always get expansions, recessions, expansions. So if you're prepared to wait that out, it's a safer bet. I used to uh, spend hours and hours thinking about which fund to go into, which, you know, should. And then when every time, every time the month came around, I'd be like, Ooh, yeah, things are looking different. Should I go to a different fund this month? And then one of my friends who who works in investments, and he just said to me, and I always ask him every month, "Hey, you think we should do something different this month?" And he'd be like, "Dude, just stick to the game plan." And he's like, "Just the same three funds you did last month. Just do the same thing again for the next ten years." I was like, "Okay, fine." And then it, I kept, I kept, I still kept questioning him for about two years. And it's only now I think I finally get it. Where I'm like, "Okay, cool. I've, it's going to be ups and downs. Right now it's a downtime." It's so you know, it's best just not to look at it. Uh, and I like what you said in the out of sight, out of mind, just invest the money that you don't need because that way then you don't have to go through the emotional sort of turmoil of seeing your money go down and seeing your money go up and, and the highs and lows that come with it. Absolutely. I've got a couple of friends that don't even look, they, they've invested in stuff that I've invested in. I've shown them what I've been doing and where it's gone over the years. Like, yeah, I'd, okay, I'd invest. Can you help me set up? So I'll help them set up. And then I'll, um, you know, they might be asking about it uh about investing some more money i'm like oh how are you getting on by the way if you looked at it it's like oh, i don't even know what my login is or i've forgotten it i'm like actually it's probably not a bad thing like you get to yeah. the point where you don't check in on it like just invest in an index tracker and get on with your life it's passive you can try and play the game and look i've tried i'm telling you for someone that's tried to do stock picking i've tried to do that for years and go down the dividend investing route i couldn't outperform the market warren buffett had a um a challenge to a, a bunch of hedge fund hedge fund managers over the course of 10 years to see who could accumulate the most and he said none of you will beat the s p 500 these are guys that are paid like hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds you know a year to outperform the market and not one of them did you know the s p 500 because they to beat the market they have to do things you know they have to go above and beyond they have to take risks and they can beat it for a year maybe a two or three they're not going to beat it for 10. Those risks will also cost them in downturns and they will lose massively. So you've, you know, it's just very difficult to beat the market. Say 90% of the people can't do it. So just 90% is good enough. Get invest on a direct debit, monthly standing order, going into the investment and just get on with your life. You can do one fund, you can do two, three. Those things don't matter. How can you get more money in the pot? That's what I'm more interested in doing. Um, when it when it comes to uh the sort of direct debit thing that, that took me a while to get my head around and it's something only recently again of something i'm just trying to set it and forget it every month because otherwise what i was trying to do is let's say you have your iso allowance every year i you know you have your twenty thousand pound iso allowance so i'll be like okay well i'm gonna allocate this so I'll, I'll i'm wait i'm looking at the i'm looking at the market thinking oh, it's gonna go down in the next five days you reckon what do you think and then you know, you're never gonna get it right right we're not we're not day traders here we're, we're, we're just trying to you know, make make those five, six, seven, eight, nine percent. Yeah, one of the things that uh, my friend always says is instead of trying to find the sort of jackpot 20, 25 percent gains that you're going to get, just focus on the five, six, seven, eight percent. Like that's where all the real long term money is going to be made. But also, what you know, what, what are you trying to achieve here? You're not a day trader, so don't try and act like a day trader. All the stress and time you're going to put towards that is just going to pull you away from other parts of your life, which is you know the whole point of this. Hey, look, I like your friend, by the way. Uh, you have to let him know because I think it's sound advice. Boring wins, unfortunately. Like it's what's the next sexy exercise, the next sexy routine? Look, look, boring wins. Just like you do the bread and butter stuff. It really and it's really consistency over time. Like the challenge is is not having to find stimulation via that. Go and find stimulation in business or some somewhere else. You know, like investing isn't it? Do boring investments and just keep with it. Like 
the amount of time I, I used to be with someone who would analyze companies and go through their financial data and have a look for opportunities when they're low and, and go down the value investing route. And I found some successes with that. And I could share some of them now. And you'd be like, oh, holy shit, this is really exciting. And this is great, Hugh. But I'll probably stay pretty stum about the ones that went down 70% or a further 90% on my money. The stock market isn't going to do that. Like the worst ever crash was, I think, around 60% in a whole global market. But it did return, you know, in a time frame. It will it will roughly go up like twice the speed. So um, you just as long as like people don't people don't weigh out the cost involved with all the time and energy and researching and trying to find that hedge versus the energy of just direct debit monthly. Get on with your life. Invest in index tracker and get on with your life. It's like it's really simple. Um, I, I I personally invest in property as well as business and they're active and the returns are far greater, but I like to play the whole, you know, the whole range. But I also invest in crypto, a smaller amount in crypto, but stocks and shares are just one of the pluses to it. It's easy to start. You can have 50 quid, a hundred quid a month and it's tax efficient. Um, you know, it's going to be roughly around 7% and it's easy. Anyone can do it. Like you can teach someone in an hour and just get on with it. Uh, and that's why I like stock market investing. For those who are inevitably, inevitably going to be like, okay, so I've signed up to Vanguard, I've signed up to AJ Bell, whichever one you choose. Um, there's a million and one passive trackers here. Which one do I pick? What What's the top three that they should invest in? So, um, again, I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone like what, what I think. Of course, yeah, yeah. I'll share. It's not financial advice, but you can see my video where I share two funds that you could do. You know, so one is a... Um, uh, one is a North American fund. Um, is it no? It's a USA fund actually. So it does the S and P five. I think it's about four thousand companies. So it does the big companies as well as the small ones, and that's on Vanguard, the Vanguard US fund. I think it's it's called. The video will have everything spread out for you. But the other one was the uh, Vanguard FTSE All Cap. Um, FTSE All Cap. So global FTSE All Cap. And um, what that is essentially is all the uh, developed world. Um, so you've got global exposure. You've got all cap means all capitalization. So uh, you've got big companies like Amazon, Google, and then you've got mid cap uh, as well as small cap. And that's about 7,000 companies in that. Uh, that was the last time I checked. It, it might well be different now. But you're 100 pound. That allocation will go in. It'll tell you what the percentage is. So maybe... 3% goes into Facebook. So out of your hundred pounds, three, three pounds of that will go to Facebook. Then, you know, 2% might be Amazon or something like that. It'll tell you what the percentages are all the way through to 7,000 companies or my first one, which was 4,000. Um, the S and P 500, if you, um, again, I'm not going to get into the weeds here with ETFs and funds. The, the long and short of it is like funds versus ETFs. They, they contain the same things, but one is act, ETF is that you can buy and um, sell on the exchange right now whilst it's live. A fund will be purchased in the next couple of days, which will be grouped together with other people that will do that. And they're also low cost. So if you, the less money you have, so people investing with a thousand pounds or less a month, they're probably better just stick into funds. OK, and the two that I just mentioned. Um, if you have more than that and you can co contrib uh, contribute maybe up to 1500 to two grand a month, you may be better off and cheaper going down the ETF route. And what I use is uh, Vanguard's um, S&P 500, which is VUSA. That's in the UK. You can find that ticker. And that is literally having a slice of the top 500 companies um, in the US. So once again, this is the financial advice. This is what I've gone through. Do your own research. But what I'm telling you, the main message is it doesn't matter as much as you think it does. It's 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 about trying to get more money into that than the actual fund itself. You know, with us coming into a recession, uh, we may be in one now, we may be going into one. Is there any sort of quick tips or advice you, you've been giving to help people manage their emotions, uh, their investing, and their approach to money? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it starts with um, with cash. So cash is a seen as a poor investment. And if you were going in long-term cash, you're right, it is a poor investment. With inflation around 9%, 10%, uh, maybe even more in real terms, if you're only getting like two and a half, three percent on your money, you're you're theoretically losing money every time, every month that goes by. 
the cost of everything is so high and you're getting so little in return, you are actually losing money. However, the advantage to having cash is that you can deploy money into assets or in case of emergency. So when, when we're looking at a recession, we want to have a backup. We want um, an emergency fund is when the first port of call. So maybe even prior to that, sorry, I would say clear debt. So before you're going down the stock investing route of trying to get your 7% a year, do you have debt? Do you have consumer debt? Do you have credit cards and loans? Because they need to go. The only like acceptable term for me would be um, mortgage. So you can keep a mortgage because normally they're at a lower rate, you know, two, three percent. Um, so once you've got debt paid off, then it would be a case of extending your emergency fund. Uh, if you have a very stable job with, let's say, a public sector job, you work in the police or something like that, you need to do something quite horrendous to get like fired from that. It's not easy to get sacked or you're not just going to abolish the police. So you could probably have a smaller emergency fund because your job is more, in air quotes, stable. If you run your own business, you know, your mom and pop business and you, you know, you might have been impacted by COVID, then you might want to extend that out maybe go for six to all, or maybe 12 months of living expenses in cash. Now you might say that's wasting money, but actually you have that peace of mind that you can ride through a lockdown of three months, six months to have less business coming in and you're still going to be okay. So clear debt, emergency fund. And then I'd even suggest that that emergency fund is probably worth six to 12 months in general, because then you have a stockpile of cash coming into a recession where we can deploy into lower cost stocks, move into property or starting a business. And um, you need to just do a little bit of research on some of the businesses that started in recessions and it's some of the best times to go into it. So uh, it's an opportunity for the wealthy. So you can say what you want about that and you, may be, you, you might not like it or disagree with it. It doesn't matter. It's not gonna change anything. So save money and try to do what the wealthy people do, play the game because it's all a game and stockpiling cash will give you options when the inevitable drop comes. Hugh, what makes um, what's made you so passionate about this topic? Um, I'm just a passionate guy. Like I, just, I, I just, from that. you know, I think I just get into stuff. You know, like I'm all in, like on things. So, um, I see a lot of people struggling when they don't need to be. That's the thing that gets me. Maybe you get it with people that are overweight or a little bit happy with how they look, and you're like, look, it isn't rocket science. You need some discipline. It's not easy, but it's not that difficult either. You just need to get going and. You don't need to be as extreme as I am or do everything that I do, but just, you know what, like you need, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You need to have finances, health and fitness and relationships down. Like those are the key three in life, like the real core. And a lot of people struggle with money problems. And by doing a little, you know, a few things moving in a certain direction, it will just alleviate a lot of stress. You know, it's not about getting super wealthy and getting all the Lambos. I mean, if that's what you want to do, like power to you. But it's really about getting it to the point where you don't longer even think about money. You know, and that, that's a nice position to be in because there's a lot of pain associated with it. And it gives you options to do amazing things, which I've been able to do. Health is the same, right? Like you don't have to be six back abs and be ripped into a, sh uh, you know, show shape necessarily. Um, I think there's some value in at least trying it once and cutting. But ultimately, it's just about getting your health to a point where it's no, it's not a drag on you, you know, because you can have all the money in the world, but if, if your health works against you and you've got like, you know, cancer or something really, you know, there's only one thing that you'd want, you know, and that's to, to improve your health. So um, I'm passionate because it makes a lot of people unhappy. It doesn't need to. And I have some quick fixes on how to improve it. I think what I really like about your approach is that it's, it's for, it's for everyone. And it's something that everyone listening on to this podcast right now can implement whether they, whether they're saving 50 pound, hundred pound, 200 pound, Ten thousand pounds a month, whatever it is, it's something you can implement and start right now, and and start making the benefits because it is a long term play, and it's very much similar. All the analogies you've given, sorry, all the things you've said are often analogies I use with with body transformation, especially yeah, right. when it comes to improving your physique. You know, you you have to invest long term to to reap the big dividends uh, from your from your efforts, and it's exactly the same in investing, unless you're a day trader or. Or in um, in our terms, you're you have the best you have God given genetics, or you're using steroids. Trying to beat the game isn't going to happen um, for 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 most of ninety nine percent of us. It's just about playing the boring long game and uh, depositing those pennies as they come in every single day and every single month, and then reaping the rewards 10, 15, 20 years later. Absolutely, yeah, spot on. I mean, you you made a comment before which I didn't 
I don't think I kind of commented on, but you were saying about kids and is it a hundred quid enough, you know, uh, like, is that really going to move the needle? Just go into a compound, j- just Google compound interest calculator. Okay. And stick a hundred pounds a month and just let it go for 20, just see what that looks like in 20 years and have a look what it looks like in 40 years and 50 years. Like how long are you going to be investing for? And you'll start to see it. It makes a massive difference over time. Small things make a difference. Um, and, you know, I, I would definitely encourage that, even if it's an extra 50 or 100 quid from some of the stuff that we talked about today. Children, I bumped into a friend in a coffee shop and I was saying, how's it all going? What's life like? And he said, you know what? It's been cheaper. He said, you know, a lot of people say it costs more money. He said, for me, it's been cheaper. I've I've kind of pulled things right back. I'm not going out as much. I'm not being so frivolous with money and throwing it around and being more conscious. And he said, I'm actually saving a little bit more now. I have a child than not. That, that, that's one case. That's not doesn't mean everyone's the case. But I think you'll probably encounter this. People like to come with the excuses and the reasons, the outliers, right? Well, I, yeah, it's easy for you. You don't have kids. It's easy for you because of X. It's easy because for you because of Y. But the reality is it's just like, what do you want? Because it's possible. Because I can find you someone that has worse circumstances than you and is doing way better. So let's not just play with the excuses. Let's just be real with what we're talking about here. If you want to improve your finances, you can do it with kids, with mortgages, with other things. There are ways around it. I'm not saying it's easy but it's doable. And that's the most important thing. There's hope. And there is someone out worse off than you that's doing better. So um, yeah, I, hopefully there's been some value in that. You know, my my YouTube channel is really about trying to help as many people as I can become financially independent. If you want to get super wealthy off the back of it and go, you know, baller style power to you, you know, I still like playing that game and seeing what I can do from a business perspective, but you don't need to, you know, you can play it easy or you can go hard. It's up to you. And where can people find out more about uh, some of your content? So on YouTube, my channel's under my name, Hugh Davis, and uh, that's H-U-W, Davis, D-A-V-I-E-S. Uh, or you can follow me on social media. I'm down as Hugh's View. So that's Hugh with an S on it and View. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can follow what I'm trying to do and reach out. Like if you're doing some stuff, like let me know. I love this stuff. Like, it's like it's fuel for me. So if you can share the stuff you tried and you've worked on and you've improved and share the wealth because you'll inspire other people as well, as well as myself. So uh, yeah come and say hello. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing a lot of valuable wisdom, uh, Hugh. I think uh, the listeners are going to take a lot of value from this. All right, mate. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the chance to speak to you again. And uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime.